Hi everyone. Thank you everyone for joining on this um, chilly Cape Town evening. Um, I'm going to be beginning with uh, lease agreements this evening. And um, what I would first like to do is just give a little bit of introduction. So South African law um, in terms of leases and lease disputes or rental disputes stem from the Dutch law and a little bit of common law. Um, and how this common law develops is through case law. So as a judge would hear a matter, the relevant law would develop. And if we look at this, the traditional forms of, of law with, re with respect to leases, there was a very unequal power balance between a landlord being the property owner and the tenant being the person coming to reside within the property. So I'm only going to be dealing with residential leases today leases. And there was an unequal bargaining power because the property has a real right property. They are entitled to use and enjoy their property as they see fit. They are entitled to encumber the property. So for instance, they got a bar over the property, they can sell it, um, they can potentially subdivide it depending on the other relevant laws. They're entitled to use and enjoy the property themselves by residing in the property, and they're also entitled to the fruits of the property. Now, if this was a farm, the fruits could be literal fruits, um, so they would be able to enjoy the, the produce from the farm. Um, but in, in everyday type of sense, when we're living in a city, fruits can also mean um, income from the rental of the property. So when a landlord engages with a tenant into a lease agreement, the landlord in that circumstance agrees to limit their rights to their property. So they say, okay, I'm not going to enjoy the full rights as I would if I was the owner residing in the property. I'm going to limit those rights and entitle someone else to reside in my property. But in return, that tenant is going to compensate me. And they can either compensate you in terms of, of um, payment, or they can compensate you in terms of, you know, making the house look really nice, affecting work in the garden, working on the farm, whatever the case may be. But there needs to be some Ooh. form of compensation. And the lease period has to be temporary. It cannot be, you can stay in this house forever. Then, it, then it's going to be a lease and will form another type of arrangement in law. So there was this unequal bargaining power in, in based on South African common law. Because we have old Roman Dutch law principles such as pacta sunt servanda. Now, what does this mean? This means if the two parties enter into an agreement, those parties are bound by the terms of that agreement. Irrespective of whether the terms of that agreement is, is fair, um, considers the circumstance of the tenant, that's irrespective. If the two parties have willingly entered into the agreement, they will be bound by those terms. So this gave the landlord a lot of power or the homeowner a lot of power because they could easily say, if you want my property, you have to accept my terms. If you don't like my, my terms, keep on walking. There's another property for you. And the as we developed as a society and as we developed principles such as in line with the constitution um, and try to create a more equal bargaining power in various contractual relationships, our, our legislature, so parliament is the one that enacts laws, decided no, they're going to bring different laws into effect to protect the interests of both parties but particularly protect the interests of tenants. So create a more equal um, bargaining power between the parties. And so in these instances, irrespective of what the parties have actually agreed in terms of a written agreement, if that is not consistent with the legislation, the terms in legislation will trump the terms in the lease agreement. And now this is very important. Um, because often I've seen it's not applicable or that act is not applicable or the parties agree to waive their respective rights. You can waive your certain rights in, a, in an agreement, but you cannot waive statutory protective mechanisms. So only if the provisions in your lease agreement are 
are more protective of the parties, more protective of the tenant, then they will they will trump the legislative provisions. But if your lease agreement um, affords the tenant less protection, then those particular provisions will be overridden uh, or usurped by the legislative provisions. So that is that's a progression of where we where why we are where we are today. And now I'd just like it to take you through three very important acts. So firstly, we've got the Prevention of Illegal Evictions from Unlawful Occupation of Land Act. It's a mouthful, but we just colloquially refer to it as, as PI, or maybe not colloquially, but among us attorneys, we just refer to it as the PI Act. I'm not going to go into great detail about PI because evictions are a whole separate webinar in and of itself, and hopefully this will be one of many webinars to come. properties, not commercial. No person may be evicted from a residential property without a court order. The parties can agree to a date where the tenant vacates, they can reach a settlement, but no landlord can come there or homeowner can come there and physically remove this person from the property. If you want to get the sheriff involved, if you want to get the police involved, they're all going to ask you where is your court order. Right. Then the next two acts are the ones I really want to focus on today. That's the Rental Housing Act and the Consumer Protection Act. So in terms of the Rental Housing Act, I've picked out a few nuggets which I feel are really important. So firstly, the Rental Housing Act places a responsibility on the landlord. I'm going to refer to it as the landlord, um, but what I mean by that is also the, the homeowner. Um, so the homeowner would obviously consent to the premises being leased out, whether that's by an agent or by another um, authorized party. So I'm gonna just refer to the landlord going further. They have the responsibility to reduce the lease to writing. So in South African law, oral contracts are valid contracts. But the issue is when there is a dispute, it becomes a he said, she said scenario. And then we end up going to court and we having to allege all of these terms of this contract that was entered into. And it can be really difficult to prove sometimes what was actually agreed between the party unless it is reduced to writing. So the Rental Housing Act tries to prevent all of this and says for the protection of both, both parties, there's a responsibility on the landlord to reduce this to writing, to reduce a lease to writing. So that's point number one. If you are a tenant currently and you've got a verbal lease, go to your landlord and say, I want my lease in writing, please. So, so that's point number, little point number one, little signal number one for, for this evening's discussion. And then secondly, receipts. It places an obligation on the landlord to provide the tenant with receipts for every amount received. So whether that is the deposit that's been paid, whether it's the monthly rental that's been paid, whether that is municipal accounts that need to be paid, whether it's arrears, whatever the case may be, the landlord needs to provide the tenant with receipts. And the act goes into really specific detail about what should be in those receipts. But in a nutshell, it just needs to have sufficient detail, it needs to stipulate which premises, which property are we talking about here? What's the lease property? Um, what date was the amount paid? how much was paid and then respectively what is that amount being attributed towards is a portion towards december rental um, a portion towards the municipal account for december um, and then potentially a portion towards arrears from the previous month and that will have to be stipulated uh, in the invoice um, and then as well with regards to deposits the landlord must obviously provide the tenant with receipts for deposit and any time during the lease the tenant may request that the landlord provide an updated um, receipt with respect to the interest because the deposit that is paid over to the landlord is actually still the tenant's money in essence until the lease comes to an end until it comes to an end, either for termination or cancellation the the money invested in terms of deposit is still deemed to be the tenant's money so there's a responsibility on the landlord to invest that money in an interest-bearing account and he needs he or she needs to provide the tenant with proof of such investment and at any time during the lease it might be six months into a two-year lease the tenant might say hey landlord you know my my deposit was 
5,000 Rand. We're now six months in. Please give me an update on, on what the money is in my, in my account. And then the landlord will have to then get a bank statement. Some people open up separate bank accounts for every tenant. Other people enter into different types of arrangements, but it must be clear which money is set aside um, for, for, for that tenant. And then what's really important is that the Rental Housing Act creates an obligation on the parties to enter into a joint incoming and a joint outgoing inspection when it comes to lease agreements. Now, this is very important. I cannot stress this more. Before the parties actually, before the actual commencement of the lease, it might be on the day that the lease starts or it might be a few days leading up to the lease starting, the parties must conduct a joint incoming inspection. So what's joint? What does joint mean? Joint means that either the landlord and the tenant must be present or a representative of either party must be present. The landlord cannot do the inspection by themselves. The tenant cannot do the inspection by themselves. Both of those parties need to be represented for it to be joint. And what is the purpose of this inspection? How, how do we go about it? So firstly, before I get to the purpose, how do we go about it? The party should walk through the premises together and go into every room, notice, look in the cupboards, look at the walls, where are there scratches, where are there cracks, where are there chip tiles? Is everything working? Do the light bulbs work? Does the oven work? Really do a thorough, thorough incoming inspection. Reduce this to writing in a report. There's also some amazing apps that you can use these days that actually takes photos and you can write notes. Um, and taking photos is obviously really helpful, whether it's in terms of an app or even just on, this, on your phone. And then for both parties to just then, after the inspection has been done, both parties to sign to confirm this was a true set of, of, set of facts. And that will be your incoming inspection. What is the purpose of this? The purpose is not to put an obligation on the landlord to affect all these changes. It doesn't mean, okay, landlord, unless you affect all these changes, I'm not moving in as a tenant or I'm not paying my first month's rental. No, 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 no. The purpose is to ascertain what was the condition of the property when the tenant moved in. Right. Why is this important? This is important because there's an obligation on the tenant to maintain the property internally for the period that they're in occupation of, of the property. Um, every lease is slightly different about what is expected, but all of them we can summarize as the tenant usually has an obligation to hand back the property to the landlord in a similar condition as what it was received. Now, this is safe for fair wear and tear. We all understand that certain things, you know, have a have a lifespan. But even in terms of light bulbs, most most leases say it's responsibility of the tenant to replace light bulbs, to clean the carpets, if there's scuff marks on the walls, to have the walls repainted, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the importance of the incoming inspection is to say, tenant, this is how you are receiving the property. And then just remember. When the lease terminates, you need to hand back the property to me in a similar condition, right? So that is the purpose. The, but on the point condition of the property, unless the parties have agreed, okay, the landlord says, it's fine, I can see the others and working, I'll fix it up for you. That's the story. to ensure that the property is habitable. So it needs to be safe for someone to live in. If you've got asbestos roof that's broken, um, that can cause you know, cancerous issues, that isn't meeting health and safety codes and specs, that's a different story. And you can take the landlord to the rental housing tribunal for those purposes, but not for the purposes of an ingoing and outgoing inspection. Okay, then when, when do you do the outgoing inspection? The outgoing inspection should take place within three days of the lease terminating, right? So most people do the outgoing inspection on the last day. The reason for this is you do the hand over the keys, you walk around, at that stage, all the boxes are packed up and your furniture is packed up. It's a little bit challenging to do an outgoing inspection when the house is still full of things and you can't really see the tip the tiles and the scratch and the snick and that. But what I do advise, I advise people to 
maybe do a bit of a staggered approach. So do an outgoing inspection about three days before or two days before so that you as a landlord can point out to a tenant which things you're not happy with. And the tenant can then say, no, 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 this was here before I got here. Or you guys can refer back to the income inspection, say, no, this did actually occur during the tenant, the tenancy. So it is responsibility of the tenant. And then the tenant actually has a little bit of time to, you know, repaint a wall, do this or do that. If you leave it to the last day, it's going to be unlikely for the tenant to be able to fix anything. You know, they might be able to quickly run down to builders and get some paint or quickly, you know, something's come out to just screw something tight again. That's possible, but not always. So then what usually happens is after the parties have done the joint outgoing inspection and they've now hopefully reached some form of agreement about um, what is to be remedied and what isn't to be remedied, um, then in that situation, if there obviously isn't time for the tenant to affect any changes because a new, a new tenant's probably moving in the next day, that's what usually happens, then the landlord is entitled to affect those remedies, those changes to the property. So repaint walls, change light bulbs, et cetera, et cetera. And those reasonable expenses can be deducted from the tenant's deposit, right? But what does the Rental Housing Act says? It says this can be deducted. However, the landlord needs to provide the tenant with proof. So we need to see slips from, from Builder's Warehouse. We need to see an invoice from painters or invoice from a cleaning company because the tenant didn't clean the, the premises to the, to the standard of the landlord. So it needs any deductions need to be supported. Okay, and then what happens? Oh, so that usually is a, a, a room for massive disputes. It's, it's often where we get involved as attorneys because the, the parties can't agree about what should be remedied and what should be deducted. Um, and that's usually when, when, we, when we get involved. But there's a lot of agencies that can assist you as well. So then what happens? Just say so the parties have now reached agreement. Um, then what happens is that the remainder of the deposit needs to be paid back to the tenant. So the Rental Housing Act sets out three, very three, sorry, my thumb was hidden here, three very clear scenarios in terms of repayment of the deposit. So if there are no deductions, so this was like the perfect tenant. They paid every month on time. There, were, there weren't any arrears, there weren't any penalties. The house is spick and span and clean. Nothing needs to be replaced. Light bulbs are working. Carpets are clean. This is a great tenant. Then the landlord has an obligation to pay back the full deposit with interest within seven working days. Right. If there are deductions to be made, then the landlord needs to attend to those deductions tend to the remedies, make the deductions, and then pay the balance back to the tenant within 14 business days. And if the landlord, the final scenario is if the landlord asks the tenant to come to the outgoing inspection and the tenant just doesn't rock up, then the landlord has to conduct the outgoing inspection themselves and then the balance and then affect the, the changes, make the deductions, and then the balance must be paid with 21 business days of the lease coming to an end. Obviously, if the tenant just absconds, like in the middle of the night, the tenant just disappears, then the termination date will then be deemed to be the date when the landlord becomes aware that the tenant is gone. And then within that period of time, the landlord will have to do the outgoing inspection themselves. But this is one point that I want to bring up for, for those of you who are landlords. Um, you have to do an incoming inspection. You have to. If you want to then make deductions. If you don't do an incoming inspection and you want to make deductions at the end of the lease, the tenant is going to tell you, no, 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 no. And the court's going to tell you, no, 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 no. You cannot make these deductions because how can you prove that these defects weren't there at the beginning of the lease? Because you've got no document to say, this is the condition I handed over to the tenant. Sorry, can you all hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you okay, now, Chelsea. Great. Sorry, I saw I lost connectivity Perfect. there. Very dramatic. <laughs> I was like, okay, <clears throat> I'm glad I'm back. Okay, so um, I think I was just kicking off with the Consumer Protection Act, so it gave me a little bit of a breather. So the Consumer Protection Act, I've seen actually quite a few leases. Now, please remember, I'm talking about residential leases today, not commercial leases. I've seen quite a few leases where it says that the Consumer Protection Act is not applicable to this lease. But if it is applicable, blah, 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 which creates a lot of confusion to a tenant who's reading a lease and also to the landlord. Because do I give five days notice? Incorporate that into. Hi, Chelsea. Sorry, I think we lost you there again. In general, the Consumer Protection Act will be applicable to residential leases. Doesn't lease property all during the course of their business, right? Of my business. Sorry, Chelsea. I'm um, sorry. I'm um, yes. Sorry, we lost you there for a bit. Um, I think there were some connectivity issues once again. Hello. I can hear, I can hear someone back. Is it better now? Am I back and connected? Much better, much, much better. Okay, great. Welcome back. Thank you. Just give me one second. Potentially also increases my my range of my so um consumer protection act i'll just i'll just take it back from there i think that's the best place to to lead from so often often leases say that the consumer protection act isn't applicable but if it is applicable then x y and z and in a nutshell that can be very confusing to any person reading the lease agreement so what i do advise all my clients whether it's a landlord or whether it's a tenant is that you incorporate the terms of the consumer protection act into the lease agreement often people say no 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 but the lease but the cpa isn't applicable as a landlord we we battling to hear you Okay, let me see if I can get better connection. Just hold on one second. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Just a reminder to please ensure that you all switch off your mics and your cameras. And should you have any questions for Chelsea once she's done with her presentation, please, please, please feel free to add your questions in uh, the chat box. Um, and then we'll get a chance to ask Chelsea as soon as she's done. Okay, is this better? Much better. Okay. Um, should I try it without my camera just to get to the end of my section? Because I don't want to lose time now with um, questions. So let me just leave my camera off and then just finish my, my, my points for the Consumer Protection Act. So in terms Perfect. of the Consumer Thank Protection you. Act, many... Pleasure. Many lease agreements say the CPA are not applicable because they'll stipulate that the landlord um, doesn't lease property in the ordinary course of their business, right? So people interpret that in terms of plain English language. They say, I'm not a property mogul, so I only lease out one property. This is in the ordinary course of my business. I'm actually an attorney and I just rent out my cottage or I am a um, artist and while I'm traveling abroad in France for six months, I just rent out my place. So this is in the ordinary course. But if you actually look at the case law, that's not what is meant by ordinary course. You have to look at the interpretation. You can only give a general meaning to, to a particular term if the act itself does not define 
what ordinary course means. And from what the Act itself says and from what, how case law is interpreted, it's clear that ordinary course is not meant by what the landlord does as their job. It actually means that entering into a lease agreement is an ordinary agreement in everyday life and in commercial life. So it actually extends to all of these types of residential agreements. And until the case law develops otherwise, that is the advice that I give my, my clients. Err on the side of caution and incorporate the terms of the CPA, because if you don't give the correct notice, then it's deemed to be repudiation, which is a breach on your side, because you actually haven't fulfilled with the correct provisions by giving the correct amount of notice. So there's two aspects in terms of the Consumer Protection Act that I want to bring to people's attention. There's two ways in which a lease can come to an end. Number one is through termination, and number two is through cancellation. So what is the difference? People often get them mixed up. Um, often even in conversation, I'll have like a slip of the tongue and refer to them interchangeably, but from legal principles, they're very different. Termination is the natural end of something. In a lease, they will say the lease commences on this day and terminates on that day. That is the termination date. Alternatively, it will say the lease commences on this day and terminates six months later, a year later, two years later. And then from that, you can calculate the termination date. That is the natural end of an agreement based on what the parties have agreed. Uh, there, nobody has done anything wrong. No one's been in breach. It's just the natural end of the agreement between the parties. But the problem is now with the Consumer Protection Act. You as a landlord can't say, okay, it's the 31st of July. Knock, 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 tenants. I'm on the door. You know in terms of the lease, you've got to get out. It's the 31st of July. No, no, no. The Consumer Protection Act says 40 to 80 business days before the termination. So we're looking at two to four months before the termination dates. The landlord needs to let the tenants know that the lease is coming to the end on the 31st of July. And then say, I'm confirming that the lease is coming to an end, or would you like to renew on the following terms? And then the parties can reach an agreement. If the parties don't reach an agreement, then the lease or, to, or they don't even discuss it. So if the landlord doesn't give them notice, uh, it's, a, it's a paying tenant, you, you barely hear from them, you get your money in your bank accounts every day, and you, you, every month and you're not faced, the lease then after the termination date will automatically renew on a month to month basis. And then either party can give the other party one month notice of termination, right? So that's termination. Then there's cancellation. Cancellation is not, oh, I just don't like this tenant anymore, or um, I can actually get a tenant to pay me a lot more money, so I'm going to kick out this tenant, or I don't like this landlord, I wanted to paint the walls blue and they said no. That's, that's not cancellation. Cancellation is a remedy to breach. So in terms of your lease, there'll be obligations in terms of the lease agreement. Every party has obligations to do particular things. Only if a party is in breach of that obligation and you've afforded them, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, 20 business days to remedy that breach and they fail to remedy the breach, can you cancel? See the difference there. So termination, natural end, cancellation, a remedy to breach. So that it seems all clear, but then the CPA, and this is my last point before we take questions, the CPA throws a bit of a curveball and it says, yes, we do provide for cancellation when there's breach, we provide for termination, but we are going to give the tenants something extra. We're going to allow them to cancel, so to end the lease early without any reason. Without any reason. The landlord doesn't need to be in breach, we don't even have to give a reason. Just as long as the tenant gives the landlord 20 business days notice. And now that doesn't seem really fair, does it? Because the landlord's like, hold on a minute, I havenven't been in breach, I haven't done anything wrong. The lease hasn't terminated in terms of our date. So now how does how is this okay that that the, the tenant can give me 20 business days notice and cancel? So in order then to balance it out a bit, 
the CPA says, but then in those circumstances, the tenant will be liable for a reasonable cancellation fee. This doesn't mean that if there's six months remaining on the lease, the tenant must pay the six months out to the landlord. That's the position that the law was before the Consumer Protection Act came into place. And that is really burdensome on a tenant. Say they got they had to relocate for business. Imagine having to pay six months rental in Cape Town and six months rental in, in Johannesburg. That's, that's um, commercially just unsound. So what it says is pay a reasonable cancellation fee and that can include the advertising costs incurred by the landlord and that can include um, the time period and lapse for them to be able to find a new tenant because it takes time. So usually there's a series of circumstances that you have to look at in order to determine what is reasonable, um, but usually it's between a month or two's rental in order to, to, to make up that cancellation penalty. So yeah, that was my last point. Um, I am open to taking some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for providing us with that insightful information. Um, so with that, I think we'll proceed ahead and take some uh, time for some questions. And just a reminder, once again, to the audience, should you have any questions, please, please put them in the chat box below. And um, please ensure that all your camera and your microphones are all switched off. Um, so I will have a look at the chat box and then ask the speakers directly any questions that may be in the audience right now. All right. So um, there is a couple of questions from my attendees. So thank you all for being so interactive. The first question that we have, um, Chelsea, is from Priscilla. So she asks, what is a reasonable remedy for a landlord for a, ten a tenant ending a lease early? For example, if the tenant moves countries or cities, does the landlord have the right to keep the tenant's deposit? Okay, so I kind of touched on that now. That's a great question. So mm -hmm. in terms of, so that would, that would fall under the, the um, early cancellation. So the tenant will be liable for a reasonable penalty. What I, the, the act itself does not stipulate what that will be. It says you must look at various factors. You must look at how long was the lease for? How long has the tenant remained in that lease for? How much of the lease is still outstanding? So say for instance, it's a two year lease and there's only two months outstanding. It's completely unreasonable to, to charge the tenant six months worth of rental. How on earth can you charge someone six months when they only had two months outstanding, right? Then the converse is also true. If someone has six months outstanding on their rental, it might also in the circumstances be completely unreasonable for them to pay out the six months because you can reasonably find another tenant within six months. But not all circumstances are the same. You might be in an area where it's just really impossible to find a tenant. You've done, the landlord's done everything within their power to advertise, to appoint an agent. And the landlord, remember, the landlord doesn't just have to accept any tenant off the street. The landlord has the right to vet a tenant, to find a suitable tenant, etc. So to answer your question, there isn't a answer. There is no cookie cutter answer. It is circumstance specific. But in order to give my clients a guideline, I usually stipulate in the lease that there'll be a two month, two month, um, uh, the penalty will be equivalent to two months worth of rental unless during that 20 business days notice period, the landlord finds a tenant that they deem to be suitable to start when the other person is moving out. So essentially there wouldn't have been a loss that they've incurred other, other than the time and effort into finding a tenant, vet, vetting a tenant. And in that circumstance, they'd only be then charged one month's worth of rental, which I think is really fair in the circumstances. Um, and then technically, what should be done is you should be able to deliver an invoice to that tenant to pay that rental, but often the tenant will then just disappear. So that's why it's so important to keep a deposit. Yes, in those circumstances, you would be able to deduct that then from the deposit. But I also make it very clear when I draft leases, I am very clear and specific what the landlord, if I'm representing the landlord, what the landlord may deduct from their deposit so that there's no room 
for, for error and conflict. We try and avoid that as much as possible. Otherwise, your options are to refer the dispute to the rental housing tribunal or to go to court. All right. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question from Lonle. So his question is a twofold question. So the first question he has is, if a landlord fails to place a deposit in interest-bearing account, what grievance mechanism does a tenant have for interest foregone? And the second question is, what can a tenant do at the end of the lease if a landlord is delaying or ignoring you on getting deposit back? Okay, so rental housing tribunal, rental housing tribunal, rental housing tribunal. <laughs> so the rental housing tribunal is is a um, is a mechanism. It's a it's a adjudication forum that anyone, any landlord or tenant can approach to lay a complaint. Um, you don't need to have legal representation, and you can literally fill in a complaint form exactly how you've stipulated now. For instance. We entered into lease until this day. The lease terminated on that day. The landlord's refusing to pay my deposit back or the converse, like the, the other option, which they said, I am currently in a, a lease agreement. I've requested the landlord to update me on the interest or they failed to failed to actually place it in an account or provide me proof thereof and, <clears throat> and tell me about the interest, excuse me. And then you can lay those complaints with the rental housing tribunal and then they will determine a court date, which is a, a very informal process, no lawyers required, no costs required, um, where the parties can both bring their versions, try and conciliate the matter. If the matter can't be conciliated, then it gets referred to an adjudicator and the adjudicator will make a determination and that determination becomes an order of court. So it's enforceable. And I think not enough people actually use this mechanism. Alternatively, you contact me as an attorney or you contact another attorney. We send a letter of demand. We put the, the, the series of facts before the party and then we see if the parties can reach an agreement. Otherwise, you issue summons, um, issue summons in court but um, with respect to that the interest um, if the person has never you'll you'll have to look at what the lease says because the lease sometimes stipulates what the interest rate should be and where it should be invested and which bank account it should be invested in and if that doesn't stipulate then I think they would look at what is the um, if you look at across all the banks what is the general interest rate in a savings account to be fair all right no, thank you for that. So um, because we need to be cognizant of time, I'll just give you two more brief questions. Okay. Um, the first being that um, from Unati, Unati would like to know, can you request proof for the repairs deducted from your deposit in a form of receipt and invoice? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. And then Nongkulu Lego is asking, um, how do you prove you are aware that a tenant has absconded? So if you have to, you would actually have to go. So usually someone stops paying rental and you would, in most leases, you have the right as a landlord to go and inspect the property. You cannot, if you've got a spare set of keys, you cannot just enter the property. That would be a violation of the tenant's rights. So you would have to make all efforts to try and contact the tenant and then rock up at the property, knock on the door, et cetera, et cetera. And then from trying to do so, eventually if you can't contact them, by email, the the address that they've given you in terms of the lease, um, phone numbers, knocking the door, appearing at a few times, not entering the premises, but knocking on the door, then it's safe to ascertain that they've left. And usually if you peer through the window or if you open the door before even entering, you should be able to see that all this stuff is gone. All right. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Thank you to everyone as well who have taken the time to ask questions in the chat box. I do apologize that we didn't get to all of them, but please, please keep the questions coming through. We're now moving on to the second part of um, today's session, which will be taken by Shelley Percox, who will take us through um, the next part of our webinar. Thank you, Shelley. Welcome. Hi, Shelly. I think you're still on mute. 
just a reminder that should you have any further questions, do not hesitate to put them in the chat box and to mute your microphones as to switch off your cameras as well. So um, uh, if you do have any more questions for me, I can take your questions along while we're waiting for, oh, they're back on. Okay, it's great. Oh, okay. there you go. All right. Thank you <laughs> Um, that's fine. um, okay, there we go. Okay, all right, I think we just thanks. Well, uh, we've now all ascertained that I'm a little bit techno <clears throat> uh, challenged in some areas, so very nice to speak to you now, finally. And thanks for making the time to spend with us this, um, this evening. Um, Chelsea, thank you. That was awesome. And um, from uh, from what I'm going to be doing now is taking you on the next step. Um, being youth in property, we all start off renting. And then the next step is keeping an eye out about when we're going to take that big leap and actually try and purchase our first property. So the very first start off is to just establish what would be a valid agreement of sale. And they're just one or two tiny little quirks that need to be um, put in place which are mainly brought in by the Alienation of Land Act that governs all, all sales of land or immovable property. Firstly, the agreement must be in writing. So if you verbally agree with somebody to buy and sell, that's not going to cut it. It has to be a written agreement and it has to be signed by both parties, purchaser and seller, with, with what we call wet ink, which means no digital signatures of any kind. It actually has to be physically signed. Then the most important thing within an agreement of sale is that you have to agree on the three P's, the property, the price, and the parties. So we have to agree on the, that we are both specifically selling and buying the same property, it's properly described. We need to be totally clear on what the purchase price for that property is, and our authority to transact in the agreement of sale must be clear, and our details as parties to the transaction must be clear too. I've just... There's a tiny little aside there. There is, a, there is a provision in the Alienation of Land Act, section 29A, that provides for the sale of residential property, not agricultural land, that if it is sold for 250,000 or less, the person who purchases can, within five business days of signature of the agreement, change their mind, terminate and revoke the whole agreement without incurring any liability. And that's just a small protection factor but um, as we know, I mean, and as prices go up, finding a property at that value becomes more and more difficult. So it doesn't very often apply, but it is there as some form of protection. Just moving on to the next slide. Okay, because this is the crux of it all. Um, entering into the property market is essentially, you're gonna be paying quite a high purchase price to acquire your first property. And we need to remember as well, is that this is probably gonna be one of the transactions that is your biggest in, in rand value that you that you perform in your lifetime and it, that relates to your home or whatever property uh, immovable property that you're buying your purchase price that you agree to can be paid in many ways ideally it would be cash if you were a lottery winner or something along those lines but for the rest of us um the normal population we need to go to a bank and we need to ask for assistance or a loan of some kind in order for us to afford to purchase a property. So if you look at the first little um, uh, point there, I refer to the National Credit Act and affordability, which is absolutely key because the National Credit Act was brought in basically to prevent people from overspending and, uh, and getting themselves into too much debt. And they've put very, very stringent rules in place about when the banks can and cannot lend. When you are first going to think about purchasing a property, I, I highly recommend that you pre-qualify, which you can do either with a mortgage bond originator or your bank of choice. But by doing that, you actually almost get your, um, your shopping list. You get um, a, an indication of what amount the bank will loan to you, so what you can go and buy a property for. Um, just remember as well that um, if you put a deposit down, it means that that you will then be able to buy a slightly higher pro um, value property because your bond will then be, say for instance, 80 or 90% of the purchase price. This is also really, really a, a good idea if it's at all possible because it might very well affect the interest rate that the bank will give you when they approve your loan. 
And one of the biggest things here to, to emphasize to you when you go and enter into the property market is that there are a lot of professionals that can assist you um, in making your entry as safe and as, um, as well, with as less overwhelm as possible. And one of the most key players is a mortgage bond originator. Your mortgage bond originator actually gets paid a fee by the banks because they're a client for the bank and they bring in quite a number of clients to different banks. You fill in one application form and they will submit to all the banks across the board and they normally will get you a much better rate than you would do by applying directly to the banks yourself. They will also be able to pre-qualify you and um, this is exceptionally handy and they really make the process a lot easier. So really, um, the, and there are a number of companies, if you go through an estate agent, they normally do have somebody that they work with quite closely. Very, very handy person. And this service is levied to you at no additional cost. So that's important to remember. The last little point that I've got under the heading of paying the purchase price is in time, after you've purchased your first property and then you decide it's time that your bachelor pad is a bit too small because you're thinking of tying the knot or doing something exciting like that, you could then use the, the proceeds of the sale of your property to buy your next property or to buy a bigger or more expensive property. When you look at that, it's highly recommended to deal with that very carefully and um, your attorney can assist you as well as your estate agent to make sure that there's no gaps in that process because there is a bit of risk and timing issues around that where you have to, unless you sell one property, wait and then purchase a bigger property. So that's how we deal with um, putting together the purchase price. And one of the things that becomes very, very relevant and is really so often not properly explained to clients is the costs associate, associated with transfer. First and foremost, transfer duty or VAT will always be paid to SARS. SARS, South African Revenue Services, will always take some form of tax and transfer duty is the property tax when you purchase as a private individual. Um, transfer duty is normally quite a sizable amount and it's, it's worked out based on your purchase price. So it is possible to ascertain what it is in advance. When we look at VAT, VAT gets charged when your seller is a VAT vendor and is selling in its ordinary course of business. And that's why when you buy properties off plan, which is, a, which is something to consider as a first purchase, and there's a new development and it gets advertised and they say no transfer duties, You've got, to you've got to read very, very carefully because transfer duty might not be payable. It might just mean that that has already been worked into the purchase price that you're paying. So just be conscious of that. But normally, if it's a VATable transaction, you won't pay transfer duty at that point in time. But transfer duty, all on its own, although the lion's share, is only part of the transfer fees that you pay. You're going to pay transfer fees to, put, to register your ownership and um, into your name. And when you're going to register your bond, you're going to pay another set of fees there. These transfer fees, it's the attorney's fees, and it, it also includes then all the other charges associated with, with transfers, which, it, which means, for instance, the deeds office registration fees, et cetera, et cetera. And it is possible to obtain a quotation. So it is possible to make provision for this in your planning to purchase a property. How do you do that? You can apply to any attorney or request, request a quotation from any attorney. Or alternatively, you could also even go online. And a lot of the banks have got bond calculators and even transfer calculators on their website. The mortgage originators also offer this kind of facility as well. And that will just give you a good idea. It won't be absolutely 100% correct, but it will give you a very good idea of what the costs are uh, that, that are going to surround your purchasing the property. And, and they actually can be, they can add up. So I really recommend that you, you make the time and effort to go and have a look at that so that you know and you don't get any unpleasant surprises. That, however, being said, there is a tiny little bit of ray of hope um, because as a first-time homeowner, you may qualify for what they used to call a 108% bond, or which means a bond that has a provision in it for costs as well. Um, and this is... This is phenomenal. It does mean that you are going to be paying those costs over a long period of time, 
but where it becomes prohibitive to get into the property market because of the costs associated in buying a property, this is a wonderful mechanism to use. Your mortgage originator will also be able to give you lots of advice about that. And what it just means is that those funds are available and they will be paid out when your bond registers. And your bond will register when your transfer registers and you become owner. That means that there is a tiny portion of time where you might have to fund payments that need to be paid. For instance, transfer duty, which needs to be paid in advance. Um, so just be aware that just be careful and discuss this with your, your bond originator because normally, as I said, there is transfer duty that will need to be paid as part of the, the process to put the property into your name, but that will only be refunded to you when it gets registered right at the end. So um, when we pass, when we register a transfer, we've got to prove to the deeds office that all the other gov government departments have been paid. So we've got to give proof of payment of transfer duty, which is the property tax, and proof of payment of all municipal charges as well, which is all, but that normally we collect from the seller. So, um, but we have to provide with proof that all other government departments have been paid before we'll be able to pass the transfer into your name. So, okay, that's a mouthful. But the last little point over here, installment sale agreements, is something that is only as a very, very last resort. It's not often um, entered into because by its nature, there is a lot of inherent risk. But in certain circumstances, you might, the, the Alienation of Land Act provides that you can pay over your purchase price installment, where it's in two or more installments over a period of more than one year, by virtue of an installment sale agreement. That knocks on a whole lot of, of um, consequences, and it's a very specific transaction. Um, you, you need protection as the purchaser, to, and you still need to pay your transfer duties as well. And this protection needs to be given to you so that the seller doesn't sell the property when you've paid off half of it or something like that. It's not an ideal solution, but it is possible in the event that it is absolutely necessary. Right, so moving along. What about the property that you're purchasing? Um, the first thing, and it sounds very much like Chelsea's, uh, like Chelsea's um, advice to you as well, is inspect the property, inspect the property, inspect the property. All right. It's quite bizarre that, um, that it's stated that most of us spend less time and we fall in love with the property and we want to buy it straight away than we would take making a much smaller purchase of another nature. Even if it's down to buying a pair of jeans, we spend more time re realistically looking at a pair of jeans or a car or something else as opposed to we walk into the property and decide this is where we want to live. It's so important to inspect. There is an inspection and a disclosure form which might be attached to the agreement which is filled out by the seller to, sell, to say, I'm not aware of any leaks, I'm not aware of this, I'm not aware of that. That disclosure form is only to the best of the seller's knowledge um, because he can't, the seller can't give you information that he doesn't know. It's, and it doesn't release you as the purchaser from the responsibility to, to carefully inspect the property and to make sure that it is in the order that you that, that you are happy with. There is such a thing as a footstool's clause, which says that the property is sold as is, and that still does apply to some uh, to a large extent, because if there is something that is paid, that is, and it talks about latent and patent defects, if there is a defect that you really and reasonably should have known about and seen, you can't you can't um, then rely on on the footstool's clause to say that the seller didn't disclose it to you. So take it seriously. And I mean, and take it slowly and inspect because in your agreement of sale, you can always request the, the seller to either correct certain items before registration of transfer, or you can use it as a negotiating tool to say, I'm putting in an offer for X amount because I'm going to need to spend this amount of money to replace the roof or whatever else it is. So inspect, inspect, inspect. This is a big purchase and it's going to be a, for a long period of time. Uh, last point there is that you also have the right to actually get a professional to inspect as well. And that's also something that's not, um, so that's also something to consider. And especially if um, you look and you perhaps suspect that there might be um, damp or something like that, and you might have a concern about the roof or something like that, uh, you can then, uh, you can then have an, a, a professional come in and give you, and give you a report um, on that property. And that would normally be for your own account unless you agree otherwise. So now that we know that we have to pay quite a bit of attention to our property, 
I just wanted to make another point about private sales versus a sale that's concluded with an estate agent. Um, often I know, or I mean, or very often, we find that the properties get sold where people aren't aware that it has to be done in writing. And somebody sells to them who honestly, sometimes, and maybe dishonestly other times, holds himself out to be the owner of the property. For instance, they have inherited the property and now they want to sell this property on to you, but they've never taken a transfer of the property in terms of from a deceased estate, or they've never property, properly concluded an agreement of sale and they are, not the, they are not the registered owner of the property. As I say, this can be completely by mistake or not, but it creates a very, very, very big problem for you as purchaser, and the transaction takes a long time to unravel and put together again, and put back together again. So in those circumstances, it's always a good idea to verify the ownership, and that if there's no estate agent involved and you have a conveyancing attorney, for instance, you can come to us, and we would then be able to assist you by checking on the deeds registry records exactly who is the registered owner so that you know you're transacting with the right person and that person is authorized to sell the property and that's very important your estate agent if you were working through an estate agent would normally have done that kind of verification because they'd also be able to pull off that information off the deeds registry um, and your estate agent is essentially going to be the person who introduces you to the property so be very clear about who has introduced you to the property and the estate agent is normally paid by the seller. And that's normally included in the agreement of sale because the seller normally picks up the bill for the commission. Okay, last, but last point on this as well, regardless of whether it's through an estate agent or a private agreement of sale, if you have a conveyancing attorney, for instance, like with us, we bring it to us, we will vet the agreement for you because there are sometimes provisions in there that can be quite onerous and it's always a good idea to understand as much to understand the agreement before you sign it. Um, we'll do this for you gladly. Okay. Right. So the next thing, moving on about the property, is that broadly speaking, there are three types of property. You have farms, you have urban, which are your normal freestanding houses in sort of in suburbia, and then you have sectional titles. And I just wanted to say just something very short and um, hopefully to the point on sectional title properties, because this is normally where you're going to start out as a first time homeowner. I think that's kind of the, the rule of thumb, because what you do when you buy into a sectional title scheme is you buy a part of a building and a share in the land that the building is built on. OK, you automatically as an owner become what, they, what is called a member of the body corporate. Body corporate is just an association of all the owners of all the different sections in the building. And um, it's it's so it's a kind of um, co-ownership of all the land surrounding when that can be gardens, that can be lifts, that can be um, various parking areas, etc. Every scheme is structured slightly, slightly differently. And that's why it's quite important to understand in the agreement of sale exactly what you are purchasing. Sections are generally your residential area where you live, um, which is your, your living area. It can also be a garage or a storeroom. And then you also have what is called exclusive use areas. And exclusive use areas, why they've been structured this way, I honestly can't tell you because it just creates a lot of confusion. But it just means it's a portion of the common property that doesn't belong directly to you as a section does, but only you can use it. And those exclusive use areas can be created in a way where you have a title deed to the, uh, to the property. That's going to increase your cost slightly when you take transfer because a new deed has to be created. Or it can be created in terms of the management rules of the scheme, which means everybody has agreed that that parking bay is just for your use. So those exclusive use areas are, are very important and it's important to understand what you are purchasing. Okay, um, I'm just going to skip right down to the, the last point there because it's absolutely fundamentally important that if you're buying into a sectional title scheme, you have, you have a set of the rules of the scheme. There are normally management rules and conduct rules, and those are going to be very, very important to determining how you enjoy your stay. For instance, um, you know, if you are a, a pet owner 
um, make very sure that your cat can move into the, the scheme with you because a lot of the schemes say that there, there are no animals allowed. So you've, it's very important to familiarize yourself with conduct and management rules. The management rules will show you if there are any particular bays and parking bays and exclusive use areas that are, are designated for your, for your use. So very important. And then also financials. A lot of the banks want to see your body corporate financials because there are situations where body corporates can be in financial difficulty and then that becomes becomes by association your problem when you become a member of the body corporate because it might prohibit you from finding a buyer when you need to sell so it's always good it was always very good practice to make sure that the you, the financials are up to date and that the body corporate is solvent and that you've got the rules of the scheme so you understand the, the terms of your, it's almost like lease agreement. It's like how you're going to live alongside all the other members and all the other owners in the scheme. Just another last little note. If you are buying into a body corporate, you are going to pay levies to, um, to the, the, the body, body corporate levies. And what these do, these levies are there to upkeep the, the common property. Note that the gardens get serviced, that the lifts get serviced, that the common areas are kept clean, that the corridors are perhaps uh, cleaned and, and washed and swept, and that there's a caretaker, etc. All of those costs are then built in, and also as well, it also includes insurance of the building, not the contents. But those kind of costs are then lumped together and shared throughout but between all the owners of the body corporate in um, proportion to the, the size of the property that you own. It's called the PQ quota normally. And it just means if you own a one bedroom, you'll pay less towards the upkeep than somebody who owns a three bedroom. So that's that's the, the kind of the basis around that. I know we're moving quite quickly, but um, I know this is, we're running a little short of time and I don't want to go, I'm try and keep, I don't want to keep you up too long. The last port, the last um, slide that I've got over here is the parties to the transaction. All right, whether you're a seller or a purchaser, the same rules pretty much apply. But I was thinking that if I was going into this as a young professional that that, um, that you all are, and in a young go-getter, I'm thinking to myself, when do I buy my personal name, and when do I, I look at a company or a trust? All right. Um, this is important. If you buy in your personal name, you when you sell, um, you pay what's called capital gains tax, just like you pay income tax on the income that you earn. If you sell a capital asset, there is normally capital gains tax payable, which is the, the profit that you make on the, on the capital asset when you sell. If it is your primary residence, you're entitled to a nice rebate, which means that you probably won't need to pay a capital gains tax. And that's really quite um, an attractive proposition, especially when it's your first, first home that you're buying. But as you go along and in time, it might, you might consider using a company because a company essentially um, will allow you to separate your assets. For instance, if you own your own business, um, and you are concerned about the fact that you might have to stand surety for the business and be exposed um, for, for solvency issues in a business um, setup, you might want to then make sure that your properties are held by a company or a trust to keep them safe because they're held by a separate legal entity. A trust is also a very good long-term estate planning tool, but then once again, when you're starting out, that's something that you can look at at a later stage because trusts and companies are taxed at a higher rate than what you as a, as a purchaser would be taxed when you sell um, and also for capital gains tax purposes. So that is almost like a down the line provision unless you are involved and working in your own business and feel that you are exposed uh, potentially to solvency issues, in which case then you might need to consider that a bit earlier. All right. So if you are an individual and you are going to be um, purchasing the property what the the various options here basically it, it revolves around marital status if you're unmarried or divorced or widowed you would be then classified as single and you would be able to purchase the property in, in your own individual name um if a, a divorce order or a death certificate is only really necessary when i mean this is if you would previously co-owned um, the property and you're now selling the property. So that's not something you would need to be too concerned about. Um, a civil marriage in community of property or out of community of property, this means just it's a, it's a court, well, it's a legal 
courts approved marriage as opposed to just uh, was opposed to just a religious marriage in community of property is where there's no anti-nuptial contract concluded and this means that you and your spouse are co-owners of everything so it means that you and your spouse would have to buy and own the property together if you conclude an anti-nuptial contract with the notary public before uh, you get married very important that you are then married out of community of property and this means that you can own the property in your own personal capacity without involving your spouse. It could also be if you married out of community of property, you can still buy it together, but then you each own half shares in the property. You can operate independently. Um, we, there are, of course, religious marriages as well, which is traditionally Muslim or Hindu rites, and they're described as such at the deeds registry, but they have the effect of, of essentially being unmarried or married out of community of property in that each party completely uh, deals separately with properties and there's no community of property created at all. Um, just on that note, it's quite interesting that there's a recent um, uh, uh, constitutional court case, which was the Women's Legal Center Trust versus President of RSA and others. Um, and in this particular instance, it just there are it's, it's earmarked changes that need to be made to the Divorce and Marriages Act to bring about equality for um, for spouses in in Muslim. Or in this particular instance, it was Mus it was a Muslim marriage, um, whereby spouses would be able to inherit inherit from their their spouse and have a claim for pension funds, etc. Um, so the legislature is going to have to make some changes in the future. So we need to keep an eye out on that um, because the idea there is to bring everybody and give everybody the same kind of rights, regardless of the form of the marriage that they've entered into. You obviously can be married according to foreign law, but if you are domiciled and ordinarily resident in South Africa, that's not going to be a concern for us at the moment. And I, I think we all are. Um, traditionally and way back when, uh, if there was a marriage in terms of the Section 22.6 of the Black Administration Act, it was automatically a married in community of property, but that won't affect any of our current audience because that was a long time ago, because since the Matrimonial Property Act um, came into play, it applies to all marriages from the 2nd of December 1988. So that's um, kind of the wrap up on, par on the parties. And, um, and I know that there is going to be a QA, and a and um, if it's not too much of an imposition, I'm going to try and see if I can find um, our wonderful Mrs. Webb, who is our powerhouse behind Webb Attorneys, and ask her to join us, because she's going to be um, just to introduce her as well. And um, and then we can take Q&A. I realize we have, we have um, gone over time slightly, but um, I'll, we will take your lead um, just as to how long we do have. Okay. And the, this is Melissa Webb, <laughs> our Web Attorneys, our wonderful... Hi, family. everyone. So I think let's lead with questions and we mm -hmm. can answer the questions jointly. that will be wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shelley, for all the informative advice that you have provided us with today. Um, so with the questions, I'll start off with the one that Luanda has posted on the chat. So it's directed to you, Shelley. Um, Note, uh, noted your points covered on the inspection before sale, but as you noted, some of these things one just can't see can't see them before prim, uh, before prim, premise. I'm not too sure if I'm um, articulating it as you would wish. Luanle formally moves to your name, or I think he wants to say premises formally moves to your name. So what happens in the case where WNT on something like a geezer burst? two months post transfer will that be on the new owner yeah so th the good thing with property is that you will always have insurance so if you own in a sectional title scheme the geezers are covered by the body corporate insurance and if you own a new individual name the bank won't bond the property unless the bond ha unless the property has homeowners insurance so mm -hmm. geezer bursts are, are covered by insurance so whether that happens post-transfer, pre-transfer, whenever it happens, whoever the owner of the property was at the time the geezer burst, that insurance policy for that owner will cover that geezer burst. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it is difficult to see everything. I mean, I was up at 6 o'clock this morning because one of the properties we transferred about a month ago, 
has a massive water leak through the ceiling and the roof because it's pouring with rain in Cape Town. And this poor purchaser had no idea that they were buying a property with a, a roof that has issues. Um, the seller claims they didn't know. The purchaser claims, how did you not know? And so we've had to get an expert out to actually inspect and say, right, where does the liability lie here? Is this a defect that was there prior to transfer or is this a new defect? And so we have to get expert advice in to see where does the liability lie. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you as well to Chelsea. I see you've been answering some of the questions that um, have been put on the chat. So that has been really, really fantastic. So we really appreciate it. I hope I have not missed out on other questions over here, but it seems that Chelsea has covered most, if not all of them. Um, and just a reminder that all um, uh, this, recorded, uh, this session will actually be recorded. And if you have any, any further questions, you may send your questions at webinar at yipa.co.za. Um, so I'm not too sure if um, Ms. Webb, if you would like to say something before we wrap it up. Yeah, I think, you know, property is just something that we, we are incredibly passionate about. It's something we fell into. And, and for those who are wanting to get into the property industry, um, going forward as a career, it is a wonderful industry. You will never get bored. Um, it's an exciting industry. And um, yeah, there, there's so much to do in it. Um, <laughs> and uh, for those people who are who are going into property for investment purposes, for first time home buyers purposes, um, I, I once did a, a show, a television show called Ask the Property Experts um, with a guy called Kura Chihoto. It used to be on the Home Channel. And Kura used to always say, there is no such thing as a stupid question. And I still live by that motto. Our door is always open. Pick up the phone, phone us. There is no such thing as a stupid question. We want to see people enter into the industry. We want to see people enter into the market. We want to help you. We want to be there for you when you buy your first home. Um, it's not possibly not going to be your forever home, but let us help you with the journey and let us guide you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. So I think then it's uh, time to wrap it up. So to our audience, thank you so much for your patience. I know that we have run over a little bit, but we are so, so grateful that you have joined us today for this webinar. We certainly hope that it has been incredibly informative and insightful in many ways. And uh, on behalf of Yipa and Web Attorneys, we appreciate you all for being here. And we will see you next time. And if you have any further questions, we do have our various social media platforms on the um, slide that is currently up right now. And uh, excuse me, do follow us on our various social media platforms and uh, send through any further questions at webinar at yipa.ca.ca. So from us, thank you all so very much and have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. Take care. Thanks, all right. Oh, this today. <laughs> <laughs>